Let us pray. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal mystery, and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Let us now be attentive to the word of God. A reading from the book of prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of men. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, no appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as striken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for us offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the sharers, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers. Though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood, but the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me. Into your hands I commend my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. 
For all my foes I am an object to object of reproach a laughing stock to my neighbors and a dread to my friends they who see me abroad flee from me I am forgotten like the unremembered dead I am like a dish that is broken Father into your hands I come and my spirit but my trust is in you O Lord I say you are my God in your hands is my destiny rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors Father into your hands I come and my spirit let your face shine upon your servant say me in your kindness take courage and be stout-hearted all you who hope in the lord father into your hands i come and my spirit A reading from the letter to the Hebrews Brothers and sisters since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus the son of God let us hold fast to our confession for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has similarly been tested in every way yet without sin So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was he learned obedience from what he suffered and when he was made perfect he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him the word of the lord thanks, thanks be, be to god you. praise to you lord jesus christ king of endless glory Praise to you Lord Jesus Christ King of endless glory Christ became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross because of this God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name Praise to you Lord Jesus Christ King of endless glory The passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered Judas his betrayer also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples so Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns torches and weapons Jesus knowing everything that was going to happen to him went out and said to them whom are you looking for they answered him Jesus, Jesus the Nazarene. Nazarene he said to them i am Judas his betrayer was also with them. When he said to them, "I am," they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, "Whom are you looking for?" They said, "Jesus, Jesus the Nazarene. Nazarene." Jesus answered, "I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go." 
This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guard seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, Are you not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly in the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather, and in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden garden with with him? him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What What charge do you bring? What what charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If if he he were were not not a criminal, criminal, we would not not have have handed handed him him over over to you. you. At this Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your laws. The Jews answered him, We do do not not have have the right right to execute execute anyone. anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own? Or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is the truth? When he said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not Not this this one, one, but Barabbas. Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. 
And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, Hail, King King of of the the Jews. Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I have found no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! him. Crucify Crucify him. him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a we law, have a law. And, according and according to that law, he ought to die, because, because he made himself the Son of God. God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you, and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you you release him, him, you are are not not a friend friend of Caesar. Caesar. Everyone Everyone who who makes makes himself himself a king king opposes Caesar. Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take "Take him away, away. take Take him him away, away. crucify Crucify him. him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no no king king but but Caesar. Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross, It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do Do not not write write the the King King of the Jews, Jews, but that he said, I am am the King King of the Jews. Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's Let's not not tear it, but cast cast lots lots for it, it, to see see whose it will be. In order that the passage of Scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit.
Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, you, Lord Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. Christ. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Not long ago, NPR and National Public Radio had a story about about a study of people who thought they were mavericks. You know, they, they thought for themselves, they followed the, the beat of their own drummer. And the leaders of the study, they, they took this group and they split them in half so that there were about 50 people in each group. And one group was taken one at a time down a long corridor into another room. And on the way into the room, they passed a man on a ladder changing a light bulb. They were placed in the room by themselves and given a test in a pencil. And they were told not to stop until they had completed the test. Well, they all started to take the test, and then they heard what sounded like a man falling off the ladder. Every single person put the pencil down, got up out of their chairs, and they went out to check on the man to make sure that he was okay. Now, the other half of these self-thinkers, these maverick leaders, they were taken down the same hallway, past the same man on the same ladder, changing the same light bulb, brought to the same room, and given exactly the same instructions. But the only difference was that the room this time had three other people already in it. And about five or ten minutes into the exam, they said that they heard what sounded like a person falling off the ladder. Now, the the three people that were in the room already, they were actually the scientists undertaking, doing the study. And these three, three people, they looked up, they looked around, and went back, taking the test. Nearly every single person did exactly the same thing. They continued taking the test, and they didn't go out to check on the guy who fell off the ladder, or it sounded like he fell off the ladder. Isn't that interesting? Now, what the test showed was that we are not really as maverick as we like to think we are. We are not the self-thinkers that we think we are. Nobody really marches by the beat of their own drum. We all follow. 
And part of that is because we are, in our very being, social creatures. We are communal by nature. And there is something in us that wants so much to fit in. We want our own group of people. We crave love. We crave approval. We crave affirmation. It's part of what's, of what's being human. It's in our DNA. And one of the things that we have learned in life is not to fight peer pressure, but to choose our peers. We surround ourselves with people who share our values because we know that we're going to be influenced by people. And so we choose people who are as focused on things as we are. And it's one of the reasons why 12-step programs are so successful. It's also why any support group is successful, because we're part of a group, and we're all focused on the same thing. As part of a group, we offer support. We offer encouragement, right? We offer the affirmation that we need. And it's offered in a way that helps us to move forward into the direction that we want to move in. We can't fight peer pressure. But what we can do is choose our peers. And one of the problems with human beings associated with that is how fickle we can be. We can be a very, very fickle people. But it's not just us. It's not just this time. It's not just this point in history. It's not just Americans. This is part of the human condition. We can be so fickle. And that's why Jesus said the night before he died, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. There are things we want to do, but if we are not encouraged, if we're not affirmed, if we're not supported by our peers to do those things that we know we ought to do, it becomes very, very difficult to do it. And so, we become fickle. The people of Israel, they were very fickle. They were led through the Red Sea. God created this path for them in the, in the midst of the sea, and they passed through the Red Sea in this miraculous and victorious way. And then, <laughs> then soon as they got to the other side, some of them wanted to honor a different God. But it's always been that way. The people in Jerusalem, they welcomed Jesus as they entered the city by waving palms and crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, a word, by the way, that means save us, Lord, in one context, and then in another context, it means thank you, Lord, for our salvations. And then just fast forward a few days, and they were all crying, crucify him, crucify him. We are a very fickle people. Now, I remember, as, as we all do here today, September 11, 2001, after the events that, that tore down the, the Twin Towers. And um, the day after, there was a commercial on TV, and it showed a neighborhood street. And it could have been any neighborhood street here in the United States, even, even Watertown, here in Watertown. And the caption of the screen said that yesterday, men did evil things and wanted to change America. And then on the next screen, 
It was flipped to September 12, 2001, and the same city street, the same city street had American flags flying in every house. And the new caption read, they succeeded. I remember how united we all felt after September 11th because nothing can, can unite a people, nothing can make us gel as much as a tragedy. And when we are united in that tragedy, we are strong. And yet, it was not much time after that that the image of the Twin Towers became not a unifying image, but really a divisive one. How long did it take before the image of those Twin Towers with the line, never forget, became the image and symbol of the justification for hatred and suspicion of Muslim Americans? Never forget really means never forgive. And it, began to, and it began to divide. We are a fickle people. That which united us brought us division. And the same thing was done to the cross. The cross of Jesus that united a people for so long, all of a sudden one day, began to be a symbol for justification for the hatred of the Jews. We are a very fickle people. This past Sunday, we bless palms. And the palms represent for us how easy it is for us to cry out, Hosanna, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings and salvation. Thank you for the goodness in my life. Thank you for the power and the presence in my life. Lord, thank you, Hosanna. And then in the very next breath, walk away from the cross. We're a very fickle people. And I think it's important to remember that and understand that because Jesus understood it. Jesus understood it, and he still died for us. And after he said that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, after he said that you're all so fickle, he still went up that hill and died on the cross for us because Jesus is not fickle. Jesus never changes his mind. And it's that cross of Jesus, that consistency of his love, the consistency of his power, that unites us. And that unity is powerful enough to span the distances all across the globe. Think about it. Christians today are celebrating the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. All across the globe today, Christians today are united. And it may be hard to see that unity when we're not in church today. Most of us are not in church today. Where it's hard to see that unity when we're listening to this, this liturgy at home on our stream. It's hard to see that unity when we're, in, we're, we're not physically together in one place. But the unity is there. The unity is still there, and it's just as powerful, if not more. When you stand in front of the cross of Jesus Christ, you never stand alone. And that's important today. Because this isolation that we're all experiencing today can be so difficult, especially for people who are recovering from addiction. And you can't get to your support group. 
If you can't get to the 12 Steps program, stand, stand before the cross. Because when you are there, you are not alone. We stand with you. And we will help you carry your cross. You are not alone. People who are elderly and who already feel so isolated and so lonely, it seems like it's all done and over. It's not. You stand up and you stare at the cross of Jesus. And when you stand in front of the cross of Jesus, you never stand alone. We are all there standing with you. We are standing with you when you just lost your job and you're so afraid that you can't make ends meet and pay your bills. We stand with you. We stand with you if you're in an abusive relationship and you can't get out. We are standing at that cross with you. You do not stand alone at the cross of Jesus because we are a communal people. We are a societal people. We are a people that support each other, that uphold each other, and that affirm each other. And this is the one day when we will not allow ourselves to be fickle about it. This is the one day when we will stand up and say, I may have gone somewhere else yesterday, but today, today I am going to the cross of Jesus Christ, and today I am going to stand there with you. I stand with everyone who needs support today. I stand with everyone whose crosses are too heavy. Today I stand with everyone who needs help to carry that cross. That's what we do as people. That's what we crave as people. And the glory of the cross is that the unity it provides can never be destroyed even by separation. I promise you. I promise you that you are not alone. I promise you, as difficult as any particular day may be, we are there with you. I promise you that our prayers are heard by, before God. I promise you that if you stand in front of the cross of Jesus Christ, you will never stand alone. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church, spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name. And we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord who chose him for the order of bishops 
may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop Terry, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the Church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed, hear our, our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our catechumens that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness for all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with, with new offspring, Increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children. And we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty and ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty and ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your people that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be, may be made more perfect witnesses to, to your love in the world. And we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right with sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty and ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you, come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will, for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty and ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, 
the assurance of peace and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty and ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for a swift end to the coronavirus pandemic that afflicts our world, that our God and Father will heal the sick, strengthen those who care for them, and help us all to persevere in faith. Almighty and merciful God, source of all life, health, and healing, look with compassion on our world, brought low by disease. Protect us in the midst of the grave, in the midst of the grave challenges that, that assail us. And in your fatherly providence, grant recovery to the stricken, strength to those who care for them, and success to those working to eradicate this scourge. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. this time we'll have the, the veneration of the cross. First the procession of the cross and the veneration of the cross. And if you're listening at home, you may want to hit pause at this point in our service and, uh, and take down your family crucifix that's hanging in your homes or, or wherever it is in your homes and, um, and adore the cross yourselves. Um, kiss the cross that's how we adore the cross, kiss the feet, the feet of Jesus on the cross or, or the wood of the cross and pass it to each uh, member of your family and your homes and they can do the same. And here at this time, I'm going to invite uh, Sister Flavia to come over. We, ha- we have our cross here in the church covered with a red, with a red cloth symbolizing the, the, the blood of Jesus, the suffering of Jesus. And uh, as, I, as I ask her to, to unveil one part of the cross... Uh, we will sing, This is the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. And you will respond, Come, let us worship. Sister? That's good. This is the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship. This is the wood of the cross, on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship. Thank you. This is the wood of the cross, on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us
At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, let us now stand and pray together. Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, deliver us, we pray, from all evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not in our sins, but on our faith. And graciously grant your peace in unity and accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. In the mingling of this body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, bring eternal life to those who receive it. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Lord Jesus Christ, your faith and your mercy and love. Your body and drink your blood. Let it not bring us condemnation, but health in mind and in body. Behold, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called the Supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. The body of Christ. Amen. body of Christ. Amen. Oh, sacred head surrounded. My crown of piercing thorn, O bleeding head so wounded, reviled and put to scorn, the power of death comes o'er you. The glow of life decays, yet angel hosts adore you and tremble as they gaze. My Jesus. I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. 
And may the abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son and the hope of the resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen.